Hi everyone, I'm Donovan, Head Director of Training and Breeding at Canine Control. Just go get the dog. Uh, just, uh... <laughs> It is the canine control philosophy that too many contemporary trainers are borrowing dog training techniques for practical use from competitive training models. True or false? Chime in. Drop us a note down below. Let us know what you think. God damn. I'm an hour late for this goddamn guy. All the way in traffic from Long Island to Brooklyn. I forget what the... Uh neighborhood did what neighborhood in Brooklyn this is all right I think it's this way <laughs> what a shitty sign Brooklyn, New York. I'm announcing myself. Okay. And my name is Donovan. I'm from Canine Control, a dog training company. I'm here to meet him. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with his Labrador. Yeah, Mako. Mako? Yeah. Diving in. Hello, Jared. How are you? I see. His name is Mako. Is that right? Oh, that's what that's what I got from the doorman, and I was kind of like, like Mako. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mako off. And then what's your fiance's name? Sarah. Sarah. It's so very nice, nice to, to meet you. you. This is Jorge. Hi, okay, Jorge. Guys? Sarah. Hey. Nice to meet you. Um, okay. In case you guys didn't have this yet, take a copy of my business card. Right. I don't know. Uh, our dog's name is Mako. He's a chocolate Labrador retriever. He's one and a half years old. We've had him since he was uh, eight weeks old. We call it Canine Control because we've been working for quite a while on his behavior generally. Uh, we want him to be a little bit better walking on the leash, a little bit better behaved. Um, here in the house um, and better off leash when we're having him at the park or out hiking or running things like that. He's also he just gets into a lot of mischief so we're just trying to make sure he's not pulling things from certain spaces and getting into things that are not his. <laughs> but our dog's biggest problem when he's in the house is he loves socks. He'll socks. pull them off of our feet, he'll find them under the bed, he'll open the drawer and get the socks and come out and run around and play with them. I know that you guys were recommended by um, Gene and Nova. That's right. And I know that you guys um, don't know them very well. Is that right? That's right. We met them, I met them once or twice just in the park. Casual. Exactly. You know, I, and I just noticed they've got a very well behaved dog. <laughs> oh, would you believe that their dog, okay, once lived up to your dog's name? <laughs> okay, their dog has a very sophisticated, genteel name like Gordon. Okay. Right, right. Not anything tough like, you know, like Outlaw shark. or Mako <laughs> or anything like Gangsta, you know what I mean? But um, let me tell you something. Their dog was a handful. Okay. He was uh, border, borderline kind of dangerous dog. Oh, okay. okay. Um, he bit me several times during the course of training the dog, and uh, everyone was afraid of the dog. You know, like their friends wouldn't come over and that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So we learned about can I control and Dominic. We were uh, walking our dog in the Karen Park. Came across a, a nice couple that was walking a very well behaved. Uh, Mastiff named Gordon, started chatting with them, asked them uh, how they, they got their training, who they used. They mentioned canine control and uh, we made a phone call and we've been in contact are? with them since. Um, in comparison, you, think you this know, is an easy job? I, I, I'm not going to uh, say, listen, every job has its challenges. You know what I'm saying? So like, 
he he may or may not, you know. He also likes to tear things. He we I have a shredder in the house. Jared didn't think we needed one in part because if Mako finds little things, he'll just he loves to shred paper. He loves toilet paper, paper. He loves it. Plastic things he likes to chew. So he doesn't swallow it, but he just likes to chew it into a bunch of little pieces, which can be troublesome. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, one of Mako's other problems is he loves to jump on the couch. He gets very excited and runs circles around our living room and jumps on the couch on the way. You know, we're concerned he's going to put holes in the couch and ruin the furniture. And he doesn't like we have a certain leash and or collar that we put on him when you take him to walk, a harness actually, and he just, when we try to put that on, he just literally tears around the house and pillows are flying, blankets are flying, things are flying off table, so we need to get that under control. Um, Jared was telling me that you guys have done some home study, you know, and tried some techniques, and that's always a that's always a very a very good sign, and I'll tell you why. Just like being a personal trainer, I draw a lot of analogies, and what I basically do is I'm I'm really a vocational instructor. Right? I teach people to become professional dog trainers, and I've adapted that towards sort of a small in-home adult education course on how to train a dog. So the most the best possible subject for me is somebody that's already motivated and interested in the subject of training their dog. And he's going to do that homework. Right. The kind of person that's not only interested in the subject is kind of more like, like here's a check, like just fix it, like, you know, that's just nice. like fix my car, you know, right. you know, right. like right. drop the car. I don't, I don't want to know how you did it, I just want it to run. They don't do as well, and to, to tell you the truth, they don't do as well with dog in general. Because unfortunately, if you own a dog, you are a dog trainer. Yeah. Just like if you're a mom, you're a psychologist, <laughs> and you're a nurse, right. and you're a relationship counselor. Yeah. And you know, you can't say to your fifth, you know, uh, fifth grade daughter, oh, I don't, I don't remember fifth grade math. Well, mom, you know what, you're going to open the book and refresh yourself. Sure. Because somebody's going to have to help her with the homework. You know, I don't remember is not going to cut it. Right? So you need to refresh yourself. So there's no way you're going to get around it. You know, you're going to have to make those calls in the middle of the night. Sure. So sometimes the average person has their pulse on, really on what's going on with the dog. But really what it comes down to, I find, um, is that what they're usually lacking is technique. Because they don't have the volume of dogs behind them. Um, regardless of how well intentioned you are and how motivated you are, right? If you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do. And when things get to a certain point where most people are able to get a dog to a certain point, people that fit the profile, you, you, I don't know what you've done, like online research, you read some books, mm -hmm, sure. that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, sure. trainer. Yeah, and uh, how old is uh, Mako? I can't, I gotta get, I can't get over the name. I still to take a couple minutes. Mako. Mako like a shark. Yeah, but when he was a cute little puppy, how the hell did you come up with the idea of Mako? He's a fisherman. I'm a big fisherman. So. Oh, you are? Yeah. So yeah. am I. So I you live live long, you right? Yeah, I live right on, you know how fish, I live closer to the water than you do. I, I believe that. <laughs> okay, I live on the beach. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, when I'm bored, I take my pole and I walk out on the jetty. Nice. And I we'll get out there. some striped bass and stuff like that. And get out there. I mean, blackfish, kingfish, like, you know, I live right on the water. So, um, where'd you grow up, by the way? Just Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Pennsylvania. You're a Philly guy. Philly guy. Are you kidding me? You're, you're, a, you're a, a Chicky and Pete guy. I am. Huh? You know that, right? Huh? Exactly. Am I a Philly guy or what? Exactly. Okay. I know Chicky and Pete as well, so I think I get there you go. Steve, great crab fries. Steve, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> Steve Steaks, Chicky and Pete, <laughs> you know, uh, Petty Pack Circle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I get a lot of good friends in Philadelphia. As a matter of fact, I have a, a whole, like, satellite group of people. Right? Check in. Is the, is the microphone still alive? you to show me a couple of the commands and things that you've been teaching him. Yeah, just whatever it is that you've been working on. Yeah. How old is he now? Year and a half. Good. That's good. Stop. Stop. Drop it. Good. Heel. Heel. Good. That's good. Stop. Good boy. Good boy. Stay. Stay. Come here. Good. Yes, that's good, buddy. That's good. That's good. Okay, I want I want you to try something, right? Sure. Um, turn him. Get him over there, but facing the kitchen. Okay. Right? Kind of. Now Stop. tell him to sit there. Sit. Right. Okay. Whenever you. Whenever you're ready. Now 
And I want I want him to stay there, right? Mm -hmm. Don't sit again. He's laying down. Make him sit. Okay. Now walk into the kitchen and make him stay there while you walk. Stay. In. Stay. Don't say anything. Okay, no. That's his release. So he yeah. heard you say okay. That's... This is very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Okay. You've done many things more right than incorrect. Good. One of the strange things that you've done, which I don't say it's so strange, but you <clears throat> taught him the heel position on the right side. You know, and I can tell you, you why. that on purpose? Yes, and you're gonna laugh. But I work right. a lot and I'm often on my Blackberry. Right. And I look at my Blackberry with my left hand and I hold the leash with my right hand. I know you probably never have heard that in your life. No, 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 no. Maybe not exactly that. Um, you know, the thing is that this is the thing. Um, almost every organized form of obedient competition yep. generally requires the dog to be on the left side. I, I was a lot of times, I was well times, aware of that. Yeah, a lot of times I, I'll tell people, I'll point it out to them, like if I'm dealing with especially handicapped individuals or there's any special requirement, we'll discuss it first. That this, in some, if you Stop. get more hooked on this than you think you're going to, and you decide later on to do something organized or competitive, that the dog, if you've spent a lot of time training the dog to heal on the opposite side, opposite side. Not, not that it couldn't be redone, particularly if you're... The, he, he's early on in his heel as well, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that, that's, he's not beyond training on that, but I really don't see us ever needing to perform with this. That's just not... It's not, it's not any goal. You it's not a goal that we see. We, but we I have it. to tell you something, though. You probably haven't been exposed to that aspect True. of the dog training community as well. Yeah. You realize that there's an entire subculture of people that are dog obsessed and dog training obsessed. And just like martial arts or anything else, like as you get better at it and you possibly are exposed to it, you may show more of a hobby interest in that. You know, you may say, oh, that would be cool. Like, I would like to have a third party impartial opinion or score about how well my dog is trained. Or I would like to compete what I've done against other amateurs and see how I do. You know what I mean? Um, I have to tell you, one of the things that's remarkable that you did right um, is that you included this release command for the dog. Okay? It's critical that you do so, and almost no one does this on their own without some... Because what happens is every command basically has three parts. Okay? there is an action part, which means, and your dog is a little bit confused between the action parts because like when you tell him to sit, Sometimes occasionally he'll lay down on his own. Sure. Okay, so there's not a purification. You don't have total isolation over the, the positionings. Um, also, the next part is an abstention part. When you tell a dog to sit and you walk away from him, um, you, in a sense, you shouldn't need to tell him any additional command. Like, I, I make the command stay obsolete. Right. Because, sit, you mean stay. because sit automatically means to stand. Well, how would the dog know when to get up? You know what I mean? But there has to be a middle part of the command. That's the abstention part. So when I tell the dog to take a position, he takes that position. And then he holds that position until I either tell him to take another position or I release him and I let him do whatever he wants which you guys have already instilled in the dog, which makes you ahead of 95% of the clientele that I begin with, I can tell you right off the bat, by two things, by your motivation level, by the relative accuracy of the foundation work that you've put into the dog, and three, by the aptitude of the dog. So you guys have a combination of mostly, there's no red flags, you have a combination of all positive factors here. You have everything it takes to make an extremely impressively trained dog. Good. Now what I'm going to ask you, I also noticed though that when I came in, he jumped on me a lot. He jumps on the counters a lot. Yeah. He's a little unruly. He's, He's a little unruly. He is a little unruly. He's a little he unruly. Is. 
Now, is that is that now? I'm not the one to judge that. Okay, um, I like I I own dogs that are very unruly. Okay, that are split second world champion level competition dogs. But if you come in my house, the dog will knock you against the wall. He'll chew on your own. He'll harass you until I tell him to stop or I put him away. Mm -hmm. And I've left the dog that way on purpose because that's the way I like my dog to be. Okay. Um, in certain situations, though, a lot of people have a hard time living as on a daily, day-to-day -day basis with their dog if the dog's not um, mindful of guests. Let's just say, you know, not civilized, sort of a little bit uncivil, you know, and uh, you know, not that he's threatening, but he's just boisterous. Right? Yes. He's a very happy dog. Yeah. Is that one of the situations that you guys find him hard to control under? Is like when he's excited, when people yes. come. Right. Like he couldn't. I couldn't keep him in a sit position anywhere with you knocking at the door. You right. heard that door. He said, I, I said sit, he knew, but he's going to break. And, he, and, he, and he, he does all the time. I will say that he, for some reason right now, he's a little bit more boisterous than he usually is. I think you're here, you're, you're kind of loud, you're excited, he's excited, but See, he, another, he is boisterous. Another Believe interesting me. thing like that I would I would perfect for you guys, like the, like I would just point out, um, just kind of pointing out. I mean, I really want to, the, the, the main message I want to indicate to you guys is that you guys have done so much more right than just about anybody I run into in the pet aspect of industry of what I do. Um, for amateurs that have no formal background in training a dog, that are just did a little self-education, you guys have done a, a fantastic job with the dog. You haven't done any, you haven't made any no major, <laughs> major mistakes. No, you haven't. What your dog actually is, is, is to kind of put it in its most simple terms, the dog is just a little undertrained, you know, which actually is good news because let's let's keep, let's take a, a very simple analogy, right? If let's say I am a let's say I'm um, a cooking coach, right? I'm a cooking coach, and I come over and I go, well, let me see your turkey, and your turkey is chawed and black, right? I'm gonna say to you, guess what? It's all but done. You can't save it. You can't inject it with fluid. You can't bring it back to life. It's cooked. Right. right. That bird is cooked. But if it's underdone, you but can it's work underdone, it. But if it's underdone, we can always go, okay, we, right. can, still, we can still work on it, right? Don't click last week. You, <laughs> you can still work on it. It's underdone. Right? It's underdone. So that means you can put it back in the oven. We can change, um, we can change the spices. We can add things to it. We can change the technique still, and you can finish it with a different technique. So what you basically have is you have a dog that has a reasonable foundation. Okay, do try do these uh, positions again with him. Try mm -hmm. to tell him, tell him sit, tell him lay down. Okay, let me see. Let me see that again. Stop. Drop it. Good. Down. Good. Come here. Good boy. That's good. That's pretty good. What was your Stop. Major, What was your major? Stop. What was your major influence? What was your major influence of the thing, the various things that you read and saw um, that you primarily follow to get you to where you are now? Um, you know the the video series on the website Mirror, it's Ed Frawley and Michael Ellis. They're they're training techniques. The I, I know that, them both personally. I, I, I figured for forty would. years. Uh, I know them both. And that's that's where, with, with the exception of I think I mentioned to you on the phone, we haven't yet gotten into any of the corrections, which is something yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I wanted more. I wanted you know better assistance before we used. You like, should. You know what? You made or, such a you made such a good choice in also your timing of when you could kind of instinctively sense that you would need a guy yeah. to go for a I don't want to do anything that can hurt the dog without, you know, actually right. there. You, you, no. Very, very wise of you. I'm, I'm no. really surprised. You know, this is this is a pretty good uh, a pretty good job. This is what I want to ask you to do just out of curiosity. I want to see something, right? What do you tell him? What's this command that you tell him to wait? Hold on. Wait a second. Until I go, hey, okay. Good boy, get it. Good boy. Good boy. Now, what's his command that you tell him? To stop. Stop is his command. Stop. Whatever. Stop. Okay. 
Good boy. Good boy. Now I'm going to show you something, right? What you guys, what you're having right now is a little bit of a lack of definition. You're also doing this a lot. When you tell the dog, stop, you kind of pull the object away from him, okay. right? Now, just as a quick tip, right? While you're doing this, right? Be very definitive. Good boy. Get it, get it. Good boy. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Stop. Okay. Okay. You see how I'm trying to create a much more definitive beginning and end. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy, good boy, get that good boy. Stop! Good boy, good boy. Now you notice that. Can I ask one quick question? Sure. So, do you like, can, so this is an important technique. Because at first I was not sure, I was sort of struggling with the fact like he's jumping all around, like he's going mm -hmm. crazy. Do we want to do that? If he gets his hands on things, does well, he not release them? What we... No, the dog needs some healthy outlet. You're never going to change the whole nature of the dog, right? You could suppress it. It's just like air, right? Mm -hmm. You pack so much air into something, it's going to find a leak, right? This dog's energy and personality is always going to be to some degree what it is. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he needs some healthy outlet that's directed for this. Okay. So playing rough and, and playing rough with him and, uh, you know, playing rough with the dog with him is a very good idea. Okay? okay? And uh, you were put on the right track by doing that because this also will help now, like you indicated, it's a more powerful reward for your dog than the food is, as well. Um, good boy. Did you notice that when I told him to let go, I didn't pull the object away from him at all? You held it. You held it still. Okay. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy, good boy, you're a good dog. Sit, sit, sit. Look, okay, good boy. Good boy, yeah, good dog. Good boy, yeah, good boy. Good boy, yeah, good boy, Mako. Good dog. <laughs> Good dog, Mako, come on. Good boy. Up. Up. Okay. Good boy, come on. Wait, wait, wait. Get in the right, right, right. Now call him heel, and I want to see what he does. Just heel? Or yeah. Okay. Oh. Mako, heel. Don't, don't do anything. Just tell him again. Mako, heel. Okay, see, he doesn't... He's not getting it. No, no, he doesn't understand. There's two parts to your heel command, okay? Part one, look, I'm like the president. This is the back phone. <laughs> We're not bombing Iraq today. Call me later. Look, the, uh, the, the fact that it matters that the heel command actually means two different things. The heel command... Actually, the heel command means one thing. It means be in this position. It means line up your left shoulder with my knee and look at me, right? Now, there's two parts to the heel command. One is coming to heel. So if I say to the dog, heel, without any gesturing or steering of the dog, you want the dog to immediately come to this position right. from any angle. If, I, if he's behind me and I say heel, he's going to come up this way. If he's in front of me and I say heel, he can either circle around this way or he can circle around this way. You have to yes. teach him that technique. We Third, need to work on that. Right. Third, heel also means now when I say, if the dog's sitting next to me and I say heel and I walk, it means now to follow. 
-hmm. So it not only means come to the heel position, it means if I tell you follow, mm -hmm. it means stay in that heel position. If I run, if I walk unusually slow, if I change my pace, my direction, the dog has to understand that, that that means to stay in that position relatively attentively. How attentively depends on the standard that you're training the dog to. If it's a competitive standard, you don't need competition. Right, it has to be super, well this is where a lot of this stuff, like see, this is where the conflict, this is where the good and the bad cross over, okay? A lot of this stuff like Michael Ellis, right, and this Learberg oriented stuff, is almost expressly competition is. oriented. Agreed. Agreed. These guys come from nothing but a background of sporting, yes. right? It's kind of like this. Let's say in self-defense you come to me and you say, I want to learn how to fight. And I go, well, there's two things I could do. In 15 years, I could make you such a good boxer that it, it would probably be really effective in the street. Or in six weeks, I could teach you every dirty technique. What to, I could teach your fiance what to do in a rape situation, and it would take a couple of hours. Right. Okay? I'm not going to teach you anything fancy about fighting. I'm going to teach you go along with it like you're going along with the rape, and then stick the pencil right in his throat and run. You know? Okay, what's the chances of you being able to put up your fists and outfight, you know, some six foot two, three hundred pound dude? Like, let's be realistic. How long would that take you, and what's the chances of that really working for you in the end, anyway? Mm -hmm. Right? So let's cut to the chase. Let's teach you something practical. Okay, carry a stun gun in your purse, stun him with the thing, pepper spray him in the eye, right? And kick him in the groin. Exactly. Exactly. And blow your whistle, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, okay. Job done. We're talking about pragmatism here. We're not talking about boxing in a ring for points. We're talking about life and death scenarios, right? So techniques that are taught to the Black Beret and the military and stuff like that are definitely going to be different than techniques techniques taught at a boxing gym. And we appreciate that. And, and that's, I mean? why it's, that's why from, from the beginning, we're not, we're looking for a well more of a, more of a practical. Exactly. A pra you we're need not, a pragmatic. We're not in, in, he's, we don't, I don't need a competition right. dog, right. dog that's competition healing. Right. I don't need. Now that's I mean, what I was that to stop. Right. And that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> that's what I'm getting at in regard to a lot of, you, you learned a lot of good techniques with, from these mostly competition background trainers because mm -hmm. they are, a, there's a lot of amazing behavioralists and dog trainers and they teach you a lot of good techniques about shaping. But I have personally witnessed and owned thousands, thousands, I've been a major police dog supplier for 35 years, thousands of Schutzen 3 dogs and world champion dogs and if I take the dog into the middle of Brooklyn Heights and take the, the leash off the dog, $25,000 dog runs down the block and it doesn't listen to me. Just because it's not because it's not in the setting that it was conditioned mm -hmm. to perform. Just like a bird dog, you could get a world champion bird dog that once you hit the field and there's birds and gunfire, the dog knows what to do. But if you take that dog to Times Square and just take his remote and his collar off, the dog runs down the block, and you're like, "This is a thirty thousand dollar dog," and he doesn't listen. Right. Well, so so, so what, you know what we're looking. For. Oh yeah. As a matter of fact. I carefully chose the name of my business, Canine Control, for a reason. Because I felt that there was a big gap, and what happens is that most of the instructors in the business are either too, they're, they're too polarized, okay? It's almost like what's going on with the politics in our country, right? You're, they're either they're so far this way or so far that way that there's like nothing in the middle that actually works. So it's kind of like what's happening in the dog training world. You either have these strictly pet, almost like Caesar Milan type, like pet. We're, I'm not a dog trainer, I'm a dog rehabilitator. Right. So yeah, okay, I can teach your dog to stop jumping on people, but like he's not gonna follow any commands. Right. That's not what I do. I just teach the dog not to crap on your rug. Okay, and then you got the other aspect is you have these competitive trainers that feel like everything that the dog does, it's all about, it's more about style than substance. It's not what you do as much as how you look doing it. Right. So they want the dog to look perfect. Like so if the dog sits slightly crooked or doesn't look at you the entire time, that's unacceptable to them. But in the real world, it's irrelevant. Exactly. The most important thing is when I call my dog, did he come to me? 
I don't care if he sat a little crooked. That's not important. Sure. Does he stay when I tell him? Does he come when I call him? Does he right. not tear up my house? Does he quit <laughs> jumping on people? I need yep. practical obedience. I need stuff that works in the real world. That's what we need. That's ah, what we need. that's where this is where you're at the crossroads. The stuff that was taught to you is primarily foundation training for competitive obedience dogs. Okay. And the techniques are good. It's which we can transition over. Of course. Easily, right. easily than the other way. Of then. course. Yeah. Much better. Right. Much better. Because you actually took time to clarify things. You had to think a lot harder about what you were doing. Because competitive obedience absolutely has a world of information. Okay? It's like working at SeaWorld. You know, you're absolutely gonna learn a lot about behavior training dolphins to jump through hoops and wave goodbye and spray the crowd and all this. You know, you'll find if you try to become a big cat trainer after 20 years of training porpoises, it's going to be a lot easier to become a big cat trainer having that background. Even though it's not the same, there's going to be a huge similarity because you've trained animals before. And the same thing with training a competition dog. Training in a competitive form actually almost makes you train to a slightly higher standard. My basic commercial pet training program is actually a hybrid form between 30 years of competitive dog training and then the reality of being an on-the-job commercial dog trainer for 25 years, actually dealing with the real-life, real-world public right. and what they actually need. Right. So I've kind of borrowed from many fields, but I'd say those two primary fields Okay, and I fuse them into something where a lot of my commercial clients will take a pet program from me and they'll walk into a, a dog training competition and they pass easily. They're usually not A's, they're usually B's. They're like, they can walk in and do a B. The dog does every material thing he's told to do relatively flawlessly. So he's kind of getting eight out of every 10 available points, which means he does it. But he might look around a tiny bit. He might have sat a little straighter. He might have been a little more attentive during the heel. So he might lose a point here and a point there. But you'll see other people at these competitions, and their dogs will blow major parts of the exercise. They'll, you've trained your dog for 90 days and titled the dog. Other people have trained their dog for three years. They tell the dog down. They walk 40 feet away and turn their back to the dog. And the crowd yelling, your dog is up. Your dog is up already. And that's after three years. So I go, wait a minute. So just think about this. I said, you outperformed 20-year veterans just now. Basically, with more of a pet style of dog training, because your dog might not have done everything as perfectly as he could have, but he did everything, and he did them reliably, and he could only be faulted in a very minor way for each exercise. Sure. Because, it was, he was, because your orientation was never to have him do it flawlessly for a show. It was to have him do it reliably under any circumstances, and that's what your dog did. He walked in the air with almost no preparation, special preparation for a show, and you came in one of the top out of 30 dogs, you came in the top five. And you're like, it's amazing. I don't even, I've never even seen this before. You know? So we've had that experience with people where we go, like, hey, you know, we have a trial coming up. We think you do well. Let me just teach you what the rules are and to your dog. And they're like, really? I think that um, you guys are going to make a great addition to uh, our family. Okay. Know? Uh, we're here in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York City, and this is how we do it here in New York. Yeah. These are some of the best tacos in all of New York City, right in this truck. And burritos. Blow your mind. You want steak, chicken, or pork? I get some, uh, casa Bienvenidos a casa mexicana. <laughs> to go in my big belly. How do you say that in Spanish? <laughs> para, para rima mia. I like messed it up. Para mi barriga. Mariga. Mariga. Parri. Parri. Ba. Pa. Ba. Pari. Parri. Parri. Body. Body. There you go. My big stomach, fat stomach, is going into. 
<laughs> Bye. There you go. This is carnita. That's me. Tarde, uh, my, my Spanish sounds like French. Look, this is all bums. It's supposed to be big spenders in New York. Uh, thank you. Okay. The economy's dead bad. Look at the happy face. Look, he's smiling now. Look. See, he put a big smile. If you chose true, you were right. Hi everybody, and thanks for watching Canine Control TV. I'd also like to say a word here about animal rescue. I'd like to thank the countless animal shelters, humane societies, and private citizens who have fostered and helped to adopt out the millions of animals that remain in our shelters today that have no permanent homes. And I'd like to take this moment also to encourage you to please consider adoption as an option for your new pet. And don't forget to subscribe to our show at youtube.com slash canine control TV show. Also, you can check us out at our website, caninecontroltv.com, or look us up on Facebook, Canine Control TV. Thanks a lot again for watching, and don't forget to adopt. Not my show! Productions.